This is Ron Shefty with Yellow Medicine Apiaries from Granite Falls in West Central Minnesota. Here I maintain 30 hives and love it because I've found beekeeping can take me down the road as far as I may want to go in any of the sciences. So, Becky and Jeff, why don't you crack the cover on this Beekeeping Today podcast episode and see where it takes us. Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Better Bee, your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Becky Masterman. Today's episode is brought to you by the Bee Nutrition Superheroes at Global Patties. Family operated and buzzing with passion, Global Patties crafts protein packed patties that'll turn your hives into powerhouse production. Picture this strong colonies, booming brood, and honey flowing like a sweet river. It's super protein for your bees, and they love it. Check out their buffet of patties, tailor-made, for your bees in your specific area. Head over to www.globalpatties.com and give your bees the nutrition they deserve. Hey, a quick shout-out to all of our sponsors who support allows us to bring you this podcast each week without resorting to a fee-based subscription. We don't want that, and we know you don't either. Be sure to check out all of our content on the website. There, you can read up on all of our guests, read our blog on the various aspects and observations about beekeeping, search for, download, and listen to over 250 past episodes, read episode transcripts, leave comments and feedback on each episode, and check on podcast specials from our sponsors. You can find it all at www.beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. There you go, Becky. There is a Minnesota beekeeper opening the show for us. Thank you, Ron Shefty from Granite Falls. Do you know where Granite Falls is, Becky? I do know where Granite Falls is, yes, but I do not know Ron, so that was a generous contribution. And I can hear the listeners. There's a collective sigh of relief that I will stop begging Minnesotans to do a listener (laughs) open. Do you hear that? (laughs) Everyone's like, oh my goodness. Thank you, Ron (laughs) Shefty. Thank you, Ron. That was excellent. And everybody, my husband's from Ohio. Kim's from Ohio. We don't have an opening from Ohio yet. At least I don't know that we do because you do have some banked, don't you? Yeah, I do have some banked yet from um, January's Louisville episode. And and folks who stopped by the booth and left an opening, be patient. We'll get through them. That's for sure. Becky, it's April. You know, most people are thinking bees, bees, bees right now, or most beekeepers are. Packages, nukes, overwintered colonies. I look forward to April with bees. April is just, I think, one of the very best beekeeping months because it gives us days where we can get through the colonies and not have to worry about temperature. Not all the days here, but we certainly do have those days. And it's just such a a lovely beginning of the season. It's a great uh, beginning also for another season, right? Baseball? (laughs) Varroa. Varroa. Yeah, we start managing Varroa more as we start managing our bees more. If you are just receiving your packages and or nukes, you know, you should be aware of them. There are different approaches you can deal with if you have a package versus with a nuke. If you have overwintered colonies, you really need to get on top of your Varroa treatments. And this leads us up to today's guest, Kirsty Staten who's here to talk about her book, Varroa Management. It is just the go-to guide for beekeepers. I think a lot of new beekeepers hear that they have to manage Varroa, they have to monitor Varroa, and they get like one slide or one like elevator pitch as far as why. And so this is a really nice book that it introduces beekeepers to the reasons why, and the different approaches to monitoring and managing Varroa. I love this book. Some listeners may be saying, oh my gosh, not another episode about Varroa. I honestly do empathize with our listeners who say that because every time I open a hive and I see a Varroa somewhere, I say, oh my gosh, not another fressum, 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 fressum Varroa <laughs> because it's, they're there. It's a reality of life. You can't ignore it. You know, everybody's had colonies. I've had colonies who I've ignored into summer, into fall, 
and they died by the first snowfall because of Varroa. So you can't underestimate the Varroa, and that's why we are beating that drum so much this year. Even if you do everything right, you can have a Varroa problem. Just it's a relentless season of monitoring and managing because the infestations can come from within population growth in your colony or the varroa can invade one way or another into your colonies. Either your bees are robbing or drifting bees. Those drones, Jeff, they do drift and they carry varroa. So the problem is that we have to keep talking about it until we are able to figure out how we can handle it and, and have the, the solution be predictable, which it's not right now. And I just want to restate that it's not just the wandering drones that bring home Varroa to the household, <laughs> all right? Just, it's not the male bee causing just the problem. It is bees robbing out failing colonies are really subject to bringing home the Varroa. Very true. It happens both ways. Both are, <laughs> both are responsible. Except if the, if the females are bringing home Varroa from a robbing adventure, at least they're bringing home some food, too. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> All right. Well, so we'll leave it at that. Becky, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with the last word on that one. So <laughs> let's, uh, let's welcome our guest, Kirsty Stanton, to the show with her book, Varroa Management, published by one of our sponsors, Northern Bee Books. Strong Microbials presents an exciting new product, Superfuel, the probiotic fondant that serves as nectar on demand for our honeybees. Superfuel is powered by three remarkable bacteria known as bacilli, supporting bees in breaking down complex substances for easy digestion and nutrient absorption. This special energy source provides all the essential amino acids, nutrients, polyphenols, and bioflavonoids, just like natural flower nectar. Vital for the bee's nutrition and overall health, Superfuel is the optimal feed for dearth periods, overwinter survival, or whenever supplemental feeding is needed. The big plus is the patties do not get hive beetle larvae, so it offers all bioavailable nutrients without any waste. Visit strongmicrobials.com now to discover more about Superfuel and get your probiotic fondant today. And while you're at the Strong Microbial site, make sure you click on and subscribe to The Hive, their regular newsletter full of interesting beekeeping facts and product updates. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the show. Sitting across the big virtual Beekeeping Today podcast table is Kirsty Stainton. She's joining us today all the way from the U.K., and she's here to talk about Varroa mites and her book, Varroa Management. Welcome, Kirsty. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, welcome. And I think it's Dr. Kirsty, isn't it? It or is, Dr. yes. Dr. Stanton. Yes. You, you oh, don't yeah. have that anywhere in your book. You hid that from Jeff, but I think I did a little digging. <laughs> well, well discovered. No, I, I did get a doctorate <laughs> back in, gosh, 2008, so a lifetime ago. It, it was my scientific, scientific credential, but these days I don't really go by that because I'm not working as a scientist anymore. But yes, it is, doctor. <laughs> I'm surrounded by scientists. Even at home, I'm surrounded by PhDs. It's just, <laughs> I feel so inadequate. All right. So, <laughs> sorry, enough about me. Kirsty, thank you for joining us. We've talked quite a bit about Varroa this year, and Becky and I have mentioned this. It's an important topic for beekeepers today. You just cannot overlook it. And that's why we invited you here today. Before we get going, we know you're a PhD. Can you give us a little bit of your background and who you are, what you do? So I got my PhD at Oxford University in molecular biology. And after that, I went on to work as a postdoc. And I worked on a little microorganism called Wolbachia. And this infects insects. And this is how I got into an interest in insects and, and then into honeybees. And sort of late on in my postdoc years, I thought, I, I want to get into honeybees. I want to do science in honeybees. So in 2016, I joined the honeybee labs in the UK called Ferra. I started doing honeybee research. And I kept doing that until about two years ago when I decided to get into science communication because through that job, I started giving lectures to beekeepers, writing articles. And I found that I was enjoying that more than the science. And I was getting a sort of, uh, I, I loved being a scientist, but I was getting tired of being in the lab and, and starting to enjoy being out in the world, actually talking to people. So that's what I do now. So I'm working full time, working on creating and updating literature about beekeeping, giving lectures about beekeeping and yeah, loving it. So 
I get the sense that you wrote this book after giving a lot of talks about Faroa <laughs> and <laughs> because it's, it's, it's so well brought together of if I'm trying to share the message of Faroa, what do beekeepers need to know? Am I right? <laughs> I, I, I hate to correct you, but actually it's the other oh, way no. around. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm no. so sorry. Um, so I actually kind of, I, I wrote the book for myself and it wasn't a book because when I started beekeeping, I didn't start beekeeping until 2016. And as you know, beekeeping is, is very difficult and, and there's lots of challenges, but I found Varroa particularly challenging to get to grips with. And I was very confused about all of the different treatments, the husbandry. And the one thing I did know as a scientist was I need to get on top of this. And so as part of my job, I was researching it. I was reading the papers and writing it down because my memory is terrible. So I was writing down all of these papers and summarizing it. And then I thought, well, I've got to write this down and keep it and come back as a reference guide when I need it in the field. And then Jeremy at Northern Bee Books approached me and said, would you like to write a book? I thought, well, actually, I found this little thing I've written for myself quite useful. Maybe other people would like it. And that's, that's kind of how the book happened. It's so user-friendly. Did you know that because of you transitioning to scientific communication? Like, how did you do that? Because this isn't a lot of notes about papers. You do reference them, but it is very, very user-friendly. I wanted to sort of distill down the important practical points. And I think as a scientist, you learn to do that because you're, you're reading papers to design research experiments and you, you sort of distill it down into a protocol, essentially. You read what you want to do and what, you, what the experiment is that you want to, to design. And then you write, one, add this, two, do that. And then that sort of, I feel that's kind of reflected in, in the, the Varroa Management book is this sort of just very simple do it like this and you'll probably be okay. <laughs> For our listeners, can I give an introduction to Varroa? Then let's talk about how do you know that you have Varroa? Varroa destructor is a fairly new parasite of honeybees. It was introduced in the UK in the 90s. I'm not sure about the figure for, for the United States. So it's only been in honeybees for, for a matter of decades. And it's a really serious parasite because of this new relationship that honeybees have with Varroa, that the native host in Asia has a variety of grooming behaviors and methods to, to deal with Varroa mite that our honeybees, European honeybees, don't have. So this, this mite, which infests the brood cells and parasitizes the, uh, the developing brood, is a real problem in colonies of European honeybee because the, the bees can't manage it themselves and you really do have to be active in your treatment against it. Varroa was introduced in the United States, I think, in the late 80s. I ran across it first in the early 90s. You had it in Minnesota. You in Florida had it first, didn't you, Becky? Jeff, it was Wisconsin and oh, Florida. Uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, they're close, aren't they? There, There's a border. <laughs> there is definitely a border. And it definitely was detected in Wisconsin before it was detected in Minnesota. <laughs> All right, so my apologies to Minnesota and condolences to Wisconsin. So, yeah, it's been around for most beekeepers who are practicing now. It's been with them as long as they've been beekeeping like you have, Kirsty. It's just part of managing honeybees. You have to manage the varroa mite. So how do you know that you have varroa mite without, I mean, we know that there's different washes and different roles. And how else can you tell that your colony has mites? You can tell by, first of all, looking in the floorboard. If you have a removable varroa tray, you can have a look in there and that will give you an indication of, of mites in the colony because that represents the natural death of mites. They will drop down into that floorboard and, and you can sort of get a very crude estimate of, of how many mites you've got. But obviously for, for more accurate monitoring, you do need those, those alcohol washes and drone brood removal unless you've got a pretty serious condition called parasitic mite syndrome which is what happens when the mite levels get very high in the colony. And the problem with the high mite levels in the colony is not just the effect of the mites parasitizing those developing brood, it's that those mites are actually introducing a virus. They're vectoring a virus between the pupae that is making the whole situation worse. So you end up with something called parasitic mite syndrome. And so if you're in a bad situation, you can recognize it through the symptoms of parasitic mite syndrome. What are some of those symptoms? Probably, first of all, you'll, you'll see some actual varroa, which is a fairly <laughs> obvious symptom. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Any varroa you see 
on the bees or on the surface of, of the frames is the tip of the iceberg because these, these guys are brood parasites. They're in the brood causing absolute mayhem. And what you start to see is, is nibbled cappings. The workers do have some rudimentary hygienic response. And so they're nibbling the cappings because they're detecting that, that something is going on in there. Once the varroa infestation gets to a very high level, they start to detect that and they nibble away trying to figure out what's going on underneath. You will end up with dead pupae. The dead pupae is actually a result of the DWV reaching very, very high levels and killing off the pupae. So you end up with this sort of the standard pepper pot brood pattern that I don't know if it's the same in the US, but in the UK, we always talk about a pepper pot brood pattern being present when a disease or disorder is present. And that's caused by the pupil death. You have deformed wings of those individuals that survive infestation and they survive the deformed wing virus, except they're kind of useless because they've got these deformed wings. They cannot function in the colony. They will die. And you'll start to see cannibalism and neglected brood. You start to see these sort of headless pupae because the bees are, are gnawing away at them. Things really start to break down. You can get very aggressive bees. I don't know if it's the same in the US, but in the UK, if you've got a varroa problem, you probably know when you're approaching the colony because they're a lot more aggressive than usual. And things really start to break down pretty quickly from there. You've got kind of a terminal decline if you are seeing all of those symptoms. So if you're starting to see those symptoms, you probably have a serious case of varroa. When you realize that your colony has parasitic mite syndrome, the hopefully the first thing that a beekeeper does is not close the hive and decide to ignore it, right? <laughs> um, we <laughs> we have a, a, a problem potentially with, with those mites or the colony totally collapsing and then the bees potentially being robbed and mite spreading. But what, what do you recommend that beekeepers do besides panic or yeah. ignore it? <laughs> well, well, I suppose prevention is the best cure. I probably shouldn't say that, but yeah, making sure you don't get to that situation. And, and the time that you're most at risk is around July and August because peak brood rearing of the bees is peak varroa rearing because that's where they live. That's where they're getting nutrition. So really keeping an eye on things through June and July when you've got peak brood rearing. And then if you do unfortunately find you've got a serious situation, you've got the mites and you've got the DWV, you really want a very fast acting, very effective treatment. And I, I know you, you guys have slightly different treatments in the States and they might have different efficacies because some products have resistance in the mites. So they're not as effective as they claim to be because of that resistance. And that's very, that that's, depends on the geographical region. But I think if I was to recommend something very, very strong for, for treating, it would be something like formic acid at that time of year. Because if you've got for a res resistance to the synthetic pesticides that contain things like tau fluvalinate and amitraz, they might not work very well. Do you recommend if somebody notices really severe signs and honestly, even just seeing a mite on the dorsal side of a bee is a serious sign. Do you recommend that they still monitor and measure their varroa level before they do something? I think monitoring is absolutely key with all of varroa management. Monitoring needs to be done throughout. I think if you're seeing parasitic mite syndrome, then just get in there and, and treat, provided you verify that, that it's indeed mites causing the symptoms because there are some conditions and disorders that may have some similar symptoms to parasitic mite syndrome. But definitely monitoring is key. And that's something that needs to be performed sort of regularly throughout the year, because each different method of monitoring that you can use depends on the time of year and what's going on in the colony. Yeah, if you look at pictures of like the parasitic mite syndrome, the brood that's been uncapped and the perforated cappings, and then you look at pictures of American fell brood, to the untrained eye, people can get really confused. And so it does make sense that they need to look for those specific signs and make sure they have not the disease, but they have mites. The one telling thing about the American fowl brood is if they're to the point where you have, what do you call it, the peppercorn, the pepper pepper pop? Pepper the, pot brood pattern. Yes. Once you get I to that point. I love that. We're going to start yeah, using that. I can't say it. Pepper pop brood pattern. Uh, <laughs> With American fowl brood, you can smell it. So if you see that, you put your nose down in a frame, you'll know the difference real quick. 
I was going to ask you, because you've referred to it a couple times, and I just want to make sure we discuss this. When you say you see one varroa on a frame or one varroa on the back of a bee, that's the tip of the iceberg, and that the majority of your problem is under the cappings. So let's restate how many varroa are generally underneath that capping. If there's varroa in that capping, generally how many varroa are underneath that capping? It depends how bad your infestation is. So if you've got a mild infestation, there should only be one mother mite who then lays her eggs and she will lay five or six eggs, depending on on how good she is, I suppose. And then the first egg will hatch into a male mite and then all the subsequent eggs will be the female mites and they will mate with that male. So essentially you've got a kind of, uh, what's the word? I don't want to say the word incestuous situation (laughs) going on, but essentially that's what it is. Um, But where you've got heavy infestations, they have found that you can have more than two mother mites per cell. And then you've got a really serious situation because one mite on its own is creating a wound in that pupa and drawing out the valuable fat body from that bee and having all of those other effects of, of vectoring viruses and so on. So, so two can only be worse. And, you know, if it's a heavy infestation, maybe up to 50% of those brood cells can contain multiple mother varroa mites. So by the time that that adult bee emerges, if they're so unlucky or lucky to the point that they do emerge, there could be five or six or more adult varroa coming out with it, or five or six adult female varroa mites looking for a new home in the cell next door or down the frame. Yeah, and they can repeat that process two or three times. So they they can do it more than that. But the average is that one mother mite will be able to repeat that process two or three times. And just think, you you then get an idea of, of why it is that varroa reproduce so quickly in the brood cells because one mother mite can have four or five daughter mites and she can go on and do it again and again. And it just gets out of hand very, very fast. And if you're running two brood boxes or more and you have, I don't know, in the state you have 20 frames of brood, it won't be full frames of brood, but let's say out of that 20 frames, you have 15 frames of brood. That's a lot of varroa that you're raising right there along with the brood at the height of summer. That's the iceberg part of the iceberg. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and, and, and summer is the hardest time because you've got the supers on the hives. You've probably not got very many options for varroa treatments. You're probably hoping that everything's going to be okay until you take those supers off and you harvest your honey. But it might not be because that's when things are really taking off for the varroa. All right, let's take this quick break to talk to our good friends at Better Bee. Are you an experienced beekeeper eager to try something new? Try making comb honey. Better Bee has you covered. Our range of ready-to-use systems, including hog half comb and Ross rounds, makes it a breeze to get started. Or craft your own cut comb right in your existing frames. With Better Bee's expert guidance, you'll soon be harvesting delicious comb honey. Explore the options at betterbee.com slash comb honey. Are you a smart beekeeper looking to stay ahead of the curve? Introducing Bee Smart Designs, the ultimate line of innovative, modular, and interchangeable hive system and cool tools. As a listener of the Beekeeping Today podcast, you understand the importance of staying informed on the latest advancements in beekeeping. This is where Bee Smart System comes in. Designed with you and your bees in mind, our core hive system works with all standard Langstroth equipment and is 8 and 10 frame compatible. Made in the USA, using recycled and American sourced materials, our products are ready to use. Visit BeSmartDesigns.com to explore our groundbreaking offerings and links to your favorite dealer. Be Smart Designs, next generation beekeeping products for the modern beekeeper. Welcome back, everybody. Kirsty, I was struck by some numbers you put in the book where you talk about if you start a season with just 50 mites in the colony. I don't think I'm ever going to forget these numbers. What can happen in 120 days? <laughs> yeah, it, it's very sobering to to see how quickly that the mites can reproduce. And that's only sort of under 
a situation of, of that being an isolated colony because obviously you've got varroa coming in from neighbouring colonies. There's drifting and, and robbing and so on. So, so the bees are, are picking up from, from all sorts of places. Yeah, if they can go from 50 to 1,000 in 120 days, and if you just think about what 50 cells in your brood nest is, it's nothing. I mean, it's just it's just so minimal. And if you think about how hard it is to control the mites underneath the cappings, it really is, I think you used the word, it is sobering to think that you have that problem and you can never eliminate them from the hive you're at a point where you're just always managing the population unless you're on some lovely island with no other bees coming into it. Yeah, I think that's a really difficult thing to accept actually and and, and there's something that there's one thing about the book that I I'm not sure it's criticism but people ask me why I didn't put shook swarming in there as a, a management tool for varroa. And I think it's a good question. I mean, could because you can manage varroa by using a shook swarm. So a shook swarm is commonly used in the UK, at least for things like fell brood infection. And what you do is you shake off all of the adult bees and, and you put the queen as well into a, a new colony with fresh foundation and it's all clean and you get rid of the brood, you destroy the brood. And we use it in the UK to treat European fell brood at low levels or early on in the year because obviously we can't do it in the autumn because you're getting rid of the brood because the brood is the source of the infection. So you get rid of all of that brood and you start again, you get nice clean wax and and the bees build up again. And the theory is, yes, that should work for varroa because you're getting rid of the brood. And this is the the general gist of, of any husbandry option for managing varroa. Get rid of the brood if that's where the varroa are. So the reason I didn't put shook swarm as an option for treatment in the book is that a shook swarm is it seems like a fairly extreme measure to do on something that you have to manage all year round. People who do use shook swarms every spring report having good results because they reduce the pathogen load in their wax and the, any residues from pesticides and so on. But for me, I just felt it was quite an extreme way of treating or managing for varroa when you can do a brood break and keep all that wax and you know maintain that energy that the, the colony has put in. But I'm not knocking it as a, as a method of reducing varroa. Indeed, it will reduce the varroa. But then you've got to think if you're doing a brood break, how are you going to kill all of those mites that are still running around on the adult bees? It's double stress. They're losing their home and then you're going to have to put some kind of a treatment on them. Yeah, so some sometimes if, if you want to avoid using chemicals, and I don't know about in the US, but in the UK, there's a lot of people who are advocating for avoiding treatments and avoiding chemicals. But then it, you, the brood break is only going to buy you a limited amount of time if all of those mites just get to run back into the, the brood cells once the queen gets started up again. Varroa has been a big topic for us. Let's skip over our specific treatment options and advise our listeners to go to Honeybee Health Coalition for those in the States. But let's talk about some of the higher level management options that you can help us with. There are a variety of ways of of managing varroa. You've sort of got, on one side, you've got the chemicals, you've got the products that you can can add to the hive to, to actively kill the mites. And on the other hand, you've got husbandry and management tools. And in most cases, that's to stimulate a brood break so that you're getting rid of the mites that are inhabiting the brood cells. But that does not kill the mites that are the only adult bees. And this is where you have to think about combining the husbandry and management tools with the chemicals. So if you're thinking about doing a brood break, for example, from queen caging, I don't know if that's popular in the States, but queen caging is a good way to stimulate a brood break. You get rid of all the brood in there, but you've still got the varroa on the surface of the bees. And something that's absolutely fantastic for a broodless period is oxalic acid. Now, oxalic acid claims to be something like 99% effective at killing mites, and actually is if you read all of the papers that have been published about it, and I have. Um, <laughs> and you can. And, and the brilliant thing about, varroa is, uh, about using oxalic acid to treat for varroa is so easy. There's different ways you can do it, but the best way is to just mix it with some sugar syrup and, and trickle it in onto, onto the bees between the frame spaces, and you can get a knockdown of over 90% of the varroa that still remain. So combining treatments is a really clever way to get more bang for your buck when you're doing your, your varroa management. We call it the dribble method here. And ah, I, I okay. don't know if that's what you call it, but that's... Trickling, that, yeah. we call it. Trickling, <laughs> dribble, trickle. And when you say combining treatments, you mean combining a chemical with a management. Yes, that's correct. what I meant to say, yes. 
We don't want a lot of chemical cocktails going on in those hives. <laughs> no. So, yeah, I, I would like to stress not to combine treatments. And I'd also like to suggest, and this is something that in the literature in the UK I felt was lacking, to draw a line between the treatments based on essential oils and organic acids and those based on synthetic pesticides. And I think it's a really, really important line. I think the pesticide-based products should be avoided if possible. And I have nothing against the companies who make them. I think these products can be really effective. But they're only really effective if you don't use them very often because the mites become resistant so quickly, especially with something like tile fluvalinate. Your mites can come, become resistant within three years of using that if you're using it repeatedly. So things that have essential oils and organic acids like thymols or oxalic acid or formic acid are the first stop for any kind of varroa treatment, but not, not a combination of those, certainly not one that's <laughs> been, been verified and approved by the authorities. And in the UK, that would be illegal. I don't know about in the US. But combining those treatments with your, your management tools like queen caging or your brood break of whatever method you, you choose to use. What's your favorite approach for Varroa, Becky? Oh, okay. Well, as you did mention, oxalic is definitely one of my go-tos at certain times of year. But my favorite, favorite, favorite approach is formic acid. I, I just absolutely, I treat every colony in the spring because I'm in an area where all of my colonies have mites because of the high density of honeybees. But everybody gets it in the spring. Everybody gets it midsummer because the risk of invasion and the, the ever presence of the rural population is, is just a fact. And I just love how my colonies look after using it. And I, I'm not a spa, I'm not getting paid to say that, but <laughs> I literally love that treatment. It has just been a game changer in keeping my bees healthy. I'm also a fan of formic acid, but actually in the UK, it's got a bit of a bad reputation. And that's because it's uh, there's some caveats to using it safely. And one of them is that your, your colony has to be more than six frames of bees and that all of your entrances have to be open, has to be very well ventilated. And I think there were some teething issues early on in, in the formic acid-based products in the UK, which has meant they've got a bad reputation. I think it's not really deserved because if it is used correctly, then it, it should be a very effective product and there may be some minimal death. And this is something that sometimes happens with the, the mite treatments. You'll observe minimal death. You'll see some worker bees or maybe even some drone, you know, some brood pulled out, for example, with thymol. And I think the gut reaction is to think, oh no, this treatment has done something bad to my bees. But actually, these things are accounted for and in the whole population of the colony, that's actually a negligible amount that's lost. And it's worth it for the varroa treatment because what the varroa are doing are is so much worse than any minimal effect of, of a chemical. Kirsty, I just want to clarify, when you say six, do you say six frames of bees? Are you talking about in a deep box? So we use nationals as a standard. We, I think we, <laughs> we're talking Langstroth? different numbers. Yes, we're talking Langstroths over here oh, okay. for the most part. I think maybe we use slightly smaller hives, which is maybe why we've had a problem less so than you. Because if you're using a bigger hive and you've got more bees, then you're less likely to have that sort of accidental overdose, which is a, an effect of population and air. In the U.S., with what we have available commercially for formic acid, the smallest colony size I would use one strip in would be a single deep. And so that's at least nine frames of bees. And so my guess is that what's being sold, so we're talking about the same effective product, but I think it's being sold in different doses. So my guess is that your dose is different than our dose just because of the equipment that's being used. So I just want to clarify that our listeners shouldn't put a strip of formic on a, a nuke colony because they might see some bad effects. <laughs> so... But yes, ventilation is so important. What are the bad effects of, of formic acid? If you go to the social media sites and you hear these horror stories of the festooning of the bees out at the front of, once they put on the formic acid, what is the proper application if we can just cover that real quickly at a high level? So with any formic acid product, it's easy to accidentally overdose if there's an insufficient population of bees. So as we said, you need a minimum of six frames of bees and you need to make sure the entrances are open and that there's plenty of ventilation getting to the hive. And if you've got the removable floor, take that tray out so that the, the, the vapors can 
dissipate. And what happens if there's an accidental overdose is that not only can you have loss of the adult bees, but you can have loss of the queens. There can be serious queen problems if formic acid is accidentally overdosed, which is why it has a bad reputation over here. And I think that when I hear about people saying they have, I, I've never really experienced queen loss because of formic application, but I and I've used it a lot. But I think that if you're using it on a colony that is in the middle of a collapse, I am not surprised that you might lose a queen. I think if the infestation is severe enough, the formic is going to be more to prevent the mites from spreading than to save your colony necessarily. Because I think if even if you have a populous colony and they're not, but it's not operating as it should because they're sick, you're, you might see some some queen loss. And so when I hear, I hear from some people sometimes that they talk a lot about queen loss, but if you go through when it was finally applied, it, it might've just been too late to actually be a successful intervention to manage the population to keep the colony healthy. Now, that's the problem with a lot of the chemical treatments is someone will say, what's the best treatment for something? And you say, well, it could be this, but you've got a learned list of things. Well, what size is the colony? What's the temperature outside, et cetera, et cetera, because that influences so much of, of how they act and they all act very differently. So it can be very confusing to, to get your head around all of these different factors. And it's changing, right? <laughs> so <laughs> so it's, it's, an, it's an ever-changing world out there. So I think once people start to understand the problem and stop chasing the mite population instead of controlling it, I think that that makes keeping your bees alive a little bit easier instead of reacting to the problem, being really proactive. I think that makes people a much better varroa manager. Yeah, it has to be an ongoing management throughout the year. Have specific set times where you check for varroa doing your monitoring methods. These should definitely be like early spring to make sure that your colony is, is getting off to a good start. And a really key thing I actually haven't mentioned is, is checking around July, August, not just because you've got to think about whether your supers are present, but one of the things that varroa does is that it parasitizes, parasitizes the fat body. And that was discovered by Sam Ramsey, who I think you may have had on your program. <laughs> and he wrote a fantastic paper about that. And the repercussions of that are those bees that have had their fat bodies damaged during that time have a reduced overwintering capacity. So you think your bees have gotten away with it if you've treated them late, but actually they're not going to survive the winter. And that's when varroa losses can manifest is actually in the spring when the bees haven't been able to make it because of the damage to their fat body. The University of Minnesota has actually shifted when they're telling beekeepers to pull those supers and intervene to an earlier date because of mite management. I think that's a good recommendation. And I mean, if you you can even put them on again afterwards as long as you've managed those mites. I don't know if you if it's common in the US to put them back on for the IV flow. We have IV here in abundance. <laughs> I wish we had an IV flow. That sounds so lovely. <laughs> Do you have an IV flow, Jeff, in Washington? <laughs> no, Blackberry. We have Blackberry <laughs> flow. IV, no, 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 no. We have goldenrod. That's our fall flow. Mm. So what about drone removal? Is that an effective control? It's actually a surprising, surprisingly effective way of, of getting rid of mites in that mites are particularly drawn to drones because drones are capped for longer than workers. And that means that mother mite has more chance of reproductive success. Maybe she can make an extra mite. Maybe she can be more successful if she goes to drone brood. And what happens is if you put a frame of drone brood into a box near the brood nest on the edge of it and you trap the mites in that drone brood and get rid of it when it's capped, you can see a 50% reduction in varroa mites. And that, that's from a study, so I guess it's very variable. That's, that's from the study I could find quantifying the effects. But you could expect something like a 50% reduction in varroa, which is fantastic for not using a chemical, but in reality that just buys you a brood cycle because they can double every brood cycle. <laughs> so it's useful. It's a good tool. <laughs> and you can do it in this country. You can do it June, July, and then you don't do it beyond that. But that buys you time. Time. It's buying you a brood cycle to keep those supers on. So at the time our listeners are listening to this episode, if they're listening to it the first week it's out, many of them are getting set to receive their packages and nukes of new bees and they're getting ready to set up the new colonies. 
what is your recommendation for Varroa management on that brand new nuke of bees that you receive or the package? Do you have any recommendations? Well, I guess package is different from a nuke because your package bees doesn't have any brood. So you can give them a little puff of oxalic acid. <laughs> I don't know how many bees are in a package bee because I've never, <laughs> I've never actually received them. So hopefully that's safe advice. <laughs> we'll send you some. We'll, we'll... <laughs> I might get into trouble for that. <laughs> we can definitely dribble them. Seven to 10,000 bees. But with nukes, you do a reduced administration of, of different products. I, I guess you have to check it first. So hopefully you've checked your nuke. You've made sure it's come from someone who isn't rearing Varroa and that they're actually rearing bees. <laughs> <laughs> and then you check, you have a look at that new nuke. You get a feel for what's going on. And if you think there might be some Varroa in there, even in spring, even a few mites is, is bad news. So you have to be careful with a nuke to make sure that you're not overdosing. We talk about overdosing formic acid, but you can actually overdose with uh, thymol or the synthetic pesticides if you don't reduce the formulation. Usually they recommend a half, but it does depend on what product you're using. So that's definitely something to be mindful of with nukes. And formic acid is a no. <laughs> with, with <nukes. laughs> Just don't do that. <laughs> Just say no to formic. <laughs> That's always a concern for, well, I think it should be a concern for when you receive new bees. Am I receiving someone else's problems, whether package or, or nuke? So I think it's an important consideration. I think so. It, I've, I've known beekeepers who have had that happen. They're new beekeepers. They're excited to get their bees. And then things aren't going the way they hoped. And they've ended up with a, a colony of of. Varroa. And in one case, I've known a beekeeper who inherited some chronic bee, which was particularly nasty because she also had a lot of Varroa in her new colony as oh. well. <laughs> All right. So this is a topic that may irritate some folks, but I, I do want to bring it up because it comes around all the time in every bee meeting is the beekeeper says, I don't need to treat for Varroa. I don't see Varroa in my bees. I have genetically hybrid bees that are good at keeping down Varroa. I've got uh, whatever. What is your recommendation about uh, non-treatment, non-management of bees? Letting them bees be bees. Okay, that's not a small question. <laughs> yeah, in, in the next few minutes, let us know. <laughs> so, I mean, that's that's a huge question. When I talk about varroa treatments, I, I dedicate quite a, a sizable portion of my lectures to talking about this because just to introduce the topic because it's such a difficult thing. But if if I was to try and do it briefly, I think. One of the key points is, is mating isolation, right? So if you're trying to breed for varroa resistance by selecting from your colonies that haven't died after you've stopped treating, but all of your neighbors are treating, then you're not going to win. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, you might think it's okay for a couple of years because sometimes the colonies can take a few years to, to actually fully die from varroa. But in the long term, it's not a viable strategy because unless you're very geographically isolated, and, and, that, and that's an important point, because you're always going to have an influx of alleles, and that is genes that are counteracting your resistance genes because you're in the minority. And another thing to think about is inbreeding. So if you're talking about trying to select for Varroa, the problem with Varroa is the colonies that die from it, it is going to be the majority. So you're going to lose nine out of 10 colonies from Varroa. Depending on, on what you're starting with, you can end up with a, with a bit of inbreeding going on in those colonies. And, and I mean, there's, uh, there's so much complexity involved in the genetics of resistance, which I'm not going to go into. But it's, it's a, very, a very complicated picture. And when you look at, on, at, as a molecular biologist, I've looked at the genetics of the genes and pathways that are suspected to be involved in varroa resistance. And there's hundreds hundreds of genes. So we're talking about, you don't need all of them to, to, select, uh, to be selected for resistance, but you need some proportion of those hundreds of genes to be involved in those, those pathways and processes for those bees to become resistant. And it's just not going to happen if that doesn't happen because the genetics is the nuts and bolts of the whole thing. So, you know, if you're isolated and you've got thousands of bees and there's no imports, knock yourself out. But otherwise, it's going to be very challenging. <laughs> All right. Well, that's, that's a truthful, honest answer in two or three minutes. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the best I've heard. So, <laughs> <laughs> This sure. is such a deep topic and we've barely scratched the surface. Is there anything that we haven't asked you 
that you were prepared and just ready to talk about for the next couple seconds. <laughs> I'll give you another two minutes. <laughs> Deformed wing virus. Conversations about Varroa and not treating for Varroa and treating for Varroa. Every conversation about Varroa seems to focus on Varroa. But deformed wing virus is a really, really important player in this situation. You're not just thinking about an interaction between a honeybee and a mite. You're thinking about the interaction between the honeybee and the mite and the virus. And this is endlessly complicated because I always say in my lectures, deformed wing virus is working for Varroa. These guys are working together. So if you're thinking about non-treatment, you're not just thinking about selecting for a bee that's that's resistant to mite. You're thinking about how that bee's coping with, with high levels of deformed wing virus. And I don't know if you know this, but deformed wing virus, the reason I say it's working for Varroa is that it increases the honeybee development time. So Varroa has more time to reproduce in those brood cells. And worse than that, DWV infected bees have been found to have, there's less of a hygienic response in the bees. The bees are less able to detect those Varroa infested cells if there's lots of DWV. So it's like the DWV is masking, it's hiding them. It's, it's keeping them hidden in, 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 a little, in the basement underneath. <laughs> and so in some cases where they have reported Varroa resistance in bees, what they've actually got is a population of bees who ha that have a virulent deformed wing virus or no deformed wing virus. And it has been found, there's a mounting body of evidence that bees that don't suffer from deformed wing virus and just don't have it present are more able to tolerate Varroa. So they're tolerating it, they're not, they're not resistant, but they can tolerate a much higher load of Varroa and they can become stable in that way. And it's very different when you start thinking about this third player in this, this horrible game between the bees and the mites. Well, Kirsty, this has been a very depressing conversation. It's, it's, Sorry. Um, <laughs> no, actually, no, it's been very enlightening. And I hadn't heard that one part about that last key point there that you pointed out about the, the DWV increasing the brood time of, of the honeybee given the varroa more time. I had not read that. That's news. That's good. Heard it here on <laughs> Beekeeping Today podcast. Kirsty, it's been great having you on the show. I hope that you keep doing some research and continue speaking and you come back and visit us again. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, Kirsty. We appreciate your visit. That was great having Kirsty on, on the show. And I'm glad that you recognized her as having a PhD. That wasn't in her book, was it? It's nowhere in her book, but I remember that when I read her book and I saw how she cited all the research... I just kind of knew she was a scientist, and so I did a little bit of digging. Well, fantastic. Caught me off guard, but it was a really great surprise. This would be the fifth time I've said this in this episode. You know, we've really been beating this Varroa thing to death, and, and it won't be the last time we've talked about it. But from today's discussion with Kirsty, who's written that very good guide on Varroa management, which is the title of the book, and you'll find the link to that on Amazon and from Northern Bee Books in our show notes, I think we can, I don't know, if we can summarize it really quick is to have a plan for varroa management, start the season, know that you're going to have to manage for it, monitor for varroa, choose a method that you want to monitor and keep records of, know your options, which options do you want? Are you going to do soft chemicals, hard chemicals? What fits your management style and your location? Well said. Manage for Varroa. Manage your bees. Manage the Varroa. Manage your whole operation for Varroa. And know that no matter what you do, and no matter how good of a beekeeper you are, you're going to lose some colonies. That's really well said, Jeff. I think, one, your last point takes some of the shame of, of Varroa infestation out of it. We all get Varroa. And depending upon what your bees are doing, you might get to unmanageable numbers before colony death occurs. But also, I think those five points put together something that's really important. Nobody wants to put chemicals in their hives. Nobody wakes up and says, oh my gosh, for no reason at all, I'm just going to apply this to the hive and see what happens. And if you have a really good management strategy and a plan, you can decrease the amount of miticide, either organic or synthetic, that you actually need to use in your hive in order to lose as few colonies as possible. And so I, I think that those five steps, if people follow them, 
and really take on the challenge of let's not let these mites increase in population to the point where they're going to kill the hive, the colony. I think it can make a difference. All right. Thanks, Becky. Yes. Let's go see our bees now in our respective states. (laughs) It's bee season. (laughs) And that about wraps it up for this episode. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to follow us and rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts wherever you download and stream the show. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. You can get there directly from our website by clicking on the reviews along the top of any web page. We want to thank our regular episode sponsors, Better Bee, Global Patty, Strong Microbials, and Northern Bee Books for their generous support. Finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to leave us questions and comments at the Leave a Comments section under each episode on the website. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks a lot, everybody.